kids love they're fascinated by World War II. They're fascinated by like monsters and ghosts <laughs> and things like that. So those are kind of evergreen topics or like space. If something falls within that umbrella, you can kind of guess that that's going to work. And then other times it's just like you love something so much that you say, you know, I I really love like the voice of this or the way this was written or the, the art in this. And I think it's such a great idea that people are going to pick this up and they're going to love it too. From the cubicle to the lab, the studio to the war room, climbing the corporate ladder or joining a scrappy startup, experience a day in the life of the jobs you want. This is the Experience a Day in the Life podcast. We interview professionals, entrepreneurs, and recent grads about what a day is actually like on the job, hour by hour, or as we like to call it, their a diddle, spelled A-D-I-T-L, which stands for a day in the life. This podcast will inspire you to gain experience beyond the classroom and launch a career of your own. We're your hosts, Chris DeBow and Matt Poe. Welcome to part one in the two-part Publish Your Passion series. In this episode, we're going to experience a day in the life, hour by hour, of Amanda She, an associate editor at Scholastic, so you can decide if this is a career you can see yourself doing. Amanda works on nonfiction books for middle grade and young adults. That means she's developing and project managing multiple books each year, acting as a key point of contact for both in-house and outside queries. We'll learn all about that. So let's get right into the day. It's 7.30 in the morning and Amanda is starting her day with email checked, social media scrolled, coffee poured, and a podcast playing. After a quick breakfast, Amanda is out the door by 8.30 to catch the train. 9.25, Amanda arrives to the office in Soho and here's what's on the agenda for the day. She's reviewing a revised manuscript, making photo corrections in a separate manuscript. She's also reviewing an additional copy edited manuscript. She's attending internal meetings and touching base with an author and also finally taking a look at some new projects. As you can already tell, Amanda is juggling multiple projects at once. So let's meet her and learn more about what she does at Scholastic. I'm Amanda Shi. I'm an associate editor at Scholastic and Scholastic is... I think still the largest children's publisher in the world. And an associate editor, I acquire and edit children's books. Personally, I do nonfiction for middle grade and YA. So that's eight to 12 and then 13 and up. So Scholastic is kind of an incredible machine. All of these different elements of Scholastic, they work separately, but together. So they are kind of separate entities, but we all collaborate. So there's Scholastic Book Fairs, which is obviously everyone's favorite childhood memory. (laughs) And then um, Scholastic Book Clubs is a whole separate thing. And that's those like pamphlets that you would get in school and you would like, you know, circle everything that you wanted. So those are actually separate things. um, And those are separate groups. And then Scholastic Trade is where I work. And so we are basically trade publishing, as we call it, is like general public publishing. So the books that you see out in the world in bookstores at airports, that's trade publishing. And then there's, you know, an education group and an audio group. It's, you know, just like a massive enterprise. Can we set the scene? What does the office look like? Oh, it's a, sure. It's probably a nice, trendy Soho office. It, it is now. Actually, the, they just did a gut renovation last year. I'm on the seventh floor and every floor also has like a wall sized like art of different characters from different books. So like on the 10th floor, there's like a huge like close up of uh, Harry Potter, which is actually kind of like alarming when you first see it because <laughs> really? it's like really big. It's like just his face super close up. What's on the seventh floor? Um, we have a book called Fly Guy. So we have like this like cartoon fly there. And then also behind in every elevator bank, there's like a Clifford the dog. They're all doing different things and they're like fuzzy so you can touch them. (laughs) And do you have an office or a desk or how's the office set up? So we're open plan. So I don't have an office, but I share kind of like an open cube space with one other person. So I have like a pretty big desk space. So then it's 925 and you're Mm -hmm. checking your email and you're going through and you're prioritizing based on urgency. And then another email that you got in your inbox that day was someone emailing you about a potential project and you already know that you're going to pass on it. What about it made you pass on it and how do you break that bad news? 
So I think this particular one was someone who had cold emailed me, so an unsolicited submission. And Scholastic's policy is we just can't consider those. We need them to come through an agency. So that already is like an automatic pass. And then I think the project itself just wasn't quite right for us. It was, you know, too... So I have a pretty good sense of like what is going to work for us a lot of the time. So if something's like too academic, that's not quite right for a trade publishing audience because, you know, again, we want something that kid is going to pick up themselves. They're not going to pick up something that looks kind of like a textbook. So, you know, you I, I always try to be like as kind as possible, like this is something that someone's put a lot of time into. So, you know. I let them know, like, our policy. I let them know it's, you know, I'm not the right person for this, but I, you know, hope that they find the right person. How many of those bad emails do you have to send usually? More than I'd like. Because often it's like I'm turning stuff down just because I don't have the support that I need for it or, you know, I don't have the bandwidth for it. You know, I can only do so many books per season and I'm just, you know, sometimes I have to say I have too many books in fall. I'm going to go insane if I try to take on this one too so so kind of building on that how many books are you juggling at once usually it kind of depends i can kind of set my workload a little bit but it tends to be i think i publish around like eight to ten books a year spread across three seasons right? yeah but they're all kind of in different stages throughout the year so right now i'm working on you know copy edits for stuff that's coming out in spring 2020 but I'm, you know, finalizing covers for stuff that's going to be in fall 2019 while trying to bring in new projects for fall 2020 and spring 21 and having phone calls with authors that we've already signed for spring 21, answering emails about marketing publicity for authors who are publishing right now, whose books are coming out right now. So it's, it all kind of melts. So speaking to that, you have to stay ahead on market trends. Mm -hmm. How can you predict something that will definitely sell within kids, young young authors mm -hmm. in 2020, 2021? Yeah, it is kind of, you have to trust your instincts a little bit. And some of it is, there are some topics that are just very evergreen, like kids love they're fascinated by World War II. They're fascinated by like monsters and ghosts <laughs> and things like that. So those are kind of evergreen topics or like space. If something falls within that umbrella, you can kind of guess that that's going to work. And then other times it's just like you love something so much that you say, you know, I I really love like the voice of this or the way this was written or the, the art in this. And I think it's such a great idea that people are going to pick this up and they're going to love it too. After the fires have been put out in her inbox and the to-do list for the day is set, now it's 10.30 and Amanda gets to work on reviewing a revised manuscript. You heard Amanda mention earlier that books go through many stages of editing. The revised version she's looking at on this day is basically a checkup to see how the author applied her feedback from the first round. That first round is crucial, so let's learn how she works through a fresh manuscript. So I read it a couple times first to just kind of get a sense of how everything fits together and um, how they're writing. And then I put notes throughout just on like very nitty gritty stuff like, oh, maybe this sentence could be said this way or like, do you want to use this word instead? Or maybe you should move this chapter or this paragraph or something. And then I also write like an editorial letter a lot of the times and that every every editor does this differently, but I tend to put like detailed notes in the manuscript using like word track changes. And then I write an editorial letter that's like, here's my like general first impression of, you know, here are like three big things that I want you to keep in mind as you're going through and making revisions. This is a book that is about, it's called True Hauntings, Deadly Disasters. So it was, it's a book that focuses on like famous haunting stories, but the history behind them. So some of my initial notes had just been to kind of make it creepier and then make sure that the text was like more immersive basically to like bring the reader into the story more. So when you say that are you like rewriting any of them or you're just flagging parts where you're like fix this however you want to It kind fix of depends it. on the manuscript and the author. For this one what I was doing was I would flag it and I would give suggestions in the comments. I, I try not to rewrite because rarely am I going to do that in the way that the author would do it. So I will offer suggestions and maybe like suggested rewrites in comments, but I kind of leave it up to them to shape it the way they would want to do it. And how many rounds do you normally go 
with um, the manuscript? Ideally, it's like two is like the dream, but a lot of times it's like three ish. Got it. And are the authors ever really like sensitive to it, or is like no? I don't agree with you. <laughs> yes and no. I I think it's it is like a delicate balance, and I think it's about treating it like a conversation. So. Sometimes authors push back, but they're not necessarily being sensitive about it. They just like they, you know, I give my reasons for wanting them to change it and they give their reasons for wanting to keep it. And we just have a discussion about it. And, you know, sometimes I win and sometimes they win. Okay. <laughs> 1130 rolls around and Amanda is pivoting to another project. She's making photo corrections in a manuscript. This book is about the first astronauts and the women who completed the same training but weren't allowed to become astronauts because they were women. You know, in these historical books, there's just so many photos and there's so many moving pieces and so many details that sometimes it's easy to make mistakes. So I was, you know, there were photos that weren't matching up to like the Excel spreadsheet we had created for it and like captions were repeated and some photos were missing. So I just had to go through and like compare the manuscript to the spreadsheet, to the photos that we had mm. um, and just make sure everything was where it needed to be. So the manuscript, it's on Word. Mm -hmm. And then what's the next step after you situate the photos and all of that? Because mm -hmm. at that point, the text is fine. Like mm -hmm. the story's good. Mm -hmm. You're just going through the elements of mm -hmm. it and the design and mm -hmm. the pizzazz. Mm -hmm. So what would be the step after you solidify this? Um, so I will, I prep a transmittal sheet and work through cover copy with the author. And we transmit all of that to production and it goes to a copy editor. They will copy edit for like grammar and do some light fact checking also. Then that will come back to us. From the copy edit round, that version of the manuscript then gets fed into a page design where the book will then start to look more like it will on the shelf, but not after several more rounds of editing. From there, you, cut, you see the page layouts and that goes to a proofreader and to us and to the author. So again, like many eyes on it and... Usually we'll do multiple rounds of that PDF, like making corrections, making corrections, making corrections up until it needs to release to the printer. And then it's kind of like, OK, you're done. And if you find a mistake, you have to wait until the next printing. I want to ask about project management and how you stay organized. A bunch of different word files, probably a bunch of different projects. Do you use a task management system? Do you guys have an in-house software? How do you keep track of everything? So we don't, which is like one of those things like publishing is just so old school that we don't have like a, we don't use like Jira or anything. And so every editor and production manager and everyone has their own kind of system. I basically have what I call like a static to-do list and like a live to-do list. So my static to-do list, I keep on like a legal pad and write down everything that needs to get done for like various projects. I use like a highlighter to like denote like how urgent it is. And then my live to-do list, I treat like my inbox as a live to-do list and I'll flag things and assign color categories to them and everything. How do you keep your focus when you have to sit down and really, really look through something, especially with so many moving parts? Mm -hmm. Luckily, it's like it's easy because you, I get to work on the things that I really love. So unless like I'm being pulled aside for like questions or meetings, then I can kind of turn away from my screen for a bit, set aside like my email for a bit and just kind of focus in on something. And sometimes that means like going to another room or, you know, doing something on the weekend or in the evening when I don't have distractions. Now it's noon and Amanda is meeting with a colleague at Scholastic Book Clubs. The book clubs department is separate from the trade department, so this discussion was a check-in to see what the two departments were up to. They wanted to see if their current projects could warrant a collaboration. She has lunch at 12.30 and is back to work by 1 p.m. The next task she's working on is reviewing cover proofs and chatting with designers going back and forth between different projects. This is a version of the book that gets sent out for publicity, marketing, and buying purposes. So this is kind of more indicative of what a day is like where I'll be working on one big thing and then 
a lot of other small things come up at the same time. So production will drop off an example of what a printed cover will look like, and I review it to make sure there are no errors, you know, like logos are where they're supposed to be, the copy is correct, like things like that, things look okay. Um, and if there are, are things that we want to change, I make comments and I route that to the designer. Otherwise, I okay it and bring it to the designer. And that was for the Fearless Felines book that I had mentioned earlier. And then I was talking to a designer, and that was for an entirely different book about multiple expeditions to climb K2, which is the second highest mountain in the Himalayas. And the author had wanted to turn those, like, stock photos of mountains into kind of like route maps for the climbing expeditions. But, you know, that's a question for the designers. Like, is that something we can do? Is that okay? Does it take too much time? And so like, that's just like a quick discussion, side discussion with them. Yeah. So it's just juggling a lot of things at once. 2 p.m. hits and Amanda attends an intellectual property idea meeting. In this meeting, everybody's in attendance from senior to entry level editors and the publisher. So a lot of publishers do this where we are interested in publishing a book on a certain topic, but we don't, we haven't received a submission that like hits that topic or we don't have an author for it. Say our book clubs and book fairs have told us that books that are focused on social issues or like activism are doing really well with their readers. Like we want to make sure that we're creating the books that our, our readers want. So we'll throw around ideas like, oh, well, what if, you know, this... This school has, like, this rule, and so, like, these kids are doing this. So we have, like, just, like, a very open discussion about it and, like, kind of throw ideas around. And from there, like, someone will take that and write up, like, something more substantial. And they'll probably bring that back. We'll workshop it some more. And if it gets to, like, a good place, then we can ultimately hopefully find an author who will actually, like, fill out the plot and, like, write the whole thing. So we're not telling anybody what to write, but we're giving them the idea After the meeting, it's now 3 p.m., and Amanda is helping an author change her pen name for a new book she's writing. She wants to change her pen name because she wants to differentiate this book from her past work. But they have to be careful because her name is tied to contracts and payments at Scholastic. At 4 p.m., Amanda is reviewing an agency submission for potential projects and has a call with a literary agent. How many submissions are you reviewing and kind of your whole process through Mm -hmm. that? I have I think right now like 10 submissions sitting in my inbox and I so I leave them in my inbox not every editor does this I leave them in my inbox because they guilt me into (laughs) reading them Um, because it's easy to like there's so much other stuff going on throughout the day it's easy to like push that aside because there's not a set deadline on it most of the time so the submission comes with we call it a proposal it like has all of this additional information so like an outline for the project and information about the author, maybe marketing ideas or titles that they think are comparable. And then for nonfiction, a lot of times you're just getting a sample. So you'll get like a few sample chapters instead of the full book because there's a lot more research involved and you don't want to like make someone do all this research if their book isn't even going to like be published. I was going to ask that because you must be spending so, so much time just sitting there reading stuff. You know what I mean? How long does it take for you to read these and then how long does it take for you to read through a manuscript? So these are like fairly quick if I can like actually sit down and focus on one thing at a time which is why I do a lot of reading on the subway because then people can't interrupt me or I don't have to run to a meeting or something but it can be like anywhere from like 30 minutes to an hour depending on how long it is and then a manuscript will take a lot longer but yeah I just go through every single one I you know read the material read kind of like the outline for it and get a sense of is this something that is right for Scholastic? Are we the best place to make make this into the book that the author wants it to be? And sometimes the answer is no, sometimes the answer is yes, and we kind of go from there. Tell us about the call with the literary agent. So I met her just before I left my old job, and because I was doing books that were so different then than what I'm doing now, it's a good time to have a conversation and just say like, Here's what I'm looking for now. Here's what I've started working on in the past year that I've been at Scholastic because they have their own clients and their own projects. And so they're always trying to find an editor who's the right fit for who they have on their list. So I like, you know, a year ago I had I was looking for very different things. So she wants to make sure that 
now she knows what I'm looking for. Does she have anybody who might fit? Do any of her colleagues have someone who might fit? And then it's one of those things, too. It's like, again, publishing is very relationship based. So it's also just kind of like catching up and making sure you're like keeping those connections. Now it's 5 p.m. and Amanda is ending the day at work with a copy edited manuscript review. And what are you looking for at this point? So basically, I'm just looking at their comments and questions. What happens is I send this to the author also. But before I send it to the author, I want to go through and make sure that, like, I understand what I'm sending them. So is it like a ton of stuff? Is it just like a few things? What kinds of questions are there? And if there are any questions that sometimes there are questions that are just for me. So I will like make replies to their comments. If it's just like, oh, like editor do you think our like house grammar style is to do it this way should we keep it or not and so like that's kind of my call and then from there I send it to the author because a lot of the times the questions are for them or they need to make changes or they have the power to say like I actually don't want to make this change that the copy editor asked me to let's leave this as it is. So 5.45 p.m., Amanda leaves the office and heads home. During her free time, she likes to exercise, bake, and spend time with her husband. And you say that you sometimes take your work at home Mm -hmm. and work on the weekends and stuff. Is that, like, expected or it's just because you like it Mm -hmm. or you want to? Um, It kind of varies. I've worked at places where it's expected, and I've worked at places where it's like, you know, you figure out, as long as you get your work done, like, you figure out, how to do that and that's kind of where I'm at now is as long as you're getting your work done like we trust you to figure out how you get that done and for me that's that means sometimes taking it home you also freelance on nights and weekends you love what you do so we want to know what's next for Amanda (laughs) I'm hoping I'm stuck at Scholastic for a bit I would love to you know keep bringing in more books and we'll see what happens So you just experienced a day in the life of an associate editor at Scholastic, but how does one actually become an editor? In part two of the Publish Your Passion series, join us as we go through Amanda's career journey and experiences leading up to where she is today. Amanda did her due diligence in college to A, make absolutely sure publishing was a career for her, and B, expose herself to the perspectives and departments of the industry so she could get a lay of the land, something every college student in every industry and every major should be doing. Learn how she did it so you can too. Stay tuned. At Experience a Day in the Life, we're building an online library of content all focused on a diddle or a day in the life of different jobs and professions across the world in all different industries. So if you want to share your a diddle, you can do so at xadiddle.com slash share dash my dash a diddle. That's x-a-d-i-t-l dot com slash share dash my dash a-d-i-t-l. Thanks for listening. Head over to xadiddle.com. That's x-a-d-i-t-l.com. There you can find the show notes for this series and more A Day in the Life articles. And you can get to know us and our guests more by joining our communities on social media. Follow at xadiddle on Instagram and on LinkedIn by searching for Krista Poe and Matt with one T Poe. If you learned something in this episode, please take some time to help our mission by leaving a positive rating and review of the show. Each week, we bring you a new interview series with guests from different jobs and different industries. In each series, we'll live a specific day in the life, hour by hour, and experience their career journey. So don't forget to subscribe.